Hi, this is Scott Hancock, and you're listening to the Sirens of Audio. G'day audiophiles, welcome to another instalment of the Sirens of Audio, it's great to have you back, my name is Dwayne, I'm your host and my co-host Philip is here with me in spirit but he'll be with me properly in a few minutes time when we talk to our special guest this month and that is the man himself, Gary Russell, the man that was there at the beginning of Big Finish, we've got Big Finish, the monthly range ending this month, so uh, what better time to have a chat with Gary Russell about those early days uh, dealing with Big Finish, but Gary was an interesting character because he's not just been involved with Big Finish Audio, he's been involved in virtually every element of Doctor Who fandom, and we get to talk to him about an awful lot of it. So this will be part one of a chat with Gary Russell. We're going to have another two instalments over the next month or two. We're not going to run them consecutively. We're going to have a few episodes in between. So I hope you enjoy our chat with Gary Russell. But before we get into that, Gary was uh, one of the fans behind Audio Visuals Productions. They produced Doctor Who fan audios back in the 1980s. It was almost like the proto Big Finish era, 20 years before Big Finish started. And from the second release onwards, Nicholas Briggs played the Doctor. So I'm going to play a little clip from a very early Audio Visuals release called The Time Ravages. And then we'll be back with our conversation with Gary Russell. Doctor, look out, Daleks. <laughs> Don't worry, it's perfectly all right. They can't hurt you. Why not? Because, bless them, they're too old. Too old? Yes, you know, it's true that I accidentally told the Daleks everything I knew about the Tempron. It's just that there's something that I didn't know. Of course, the time dislocation effect that the Tempron protected all of us from. That's right. These Daleks can travel through time at will, but they age accordingly, poor things. Knowing that the first target would be us, the Tempron lured them into the distant future. Now they're so old, they can't even muster the will to travel back in time to save themselves. Rather sad, really, isn't it? They'll be dead soon. Not even Daleks live forever. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome tonight uh, Gary Russell. Gary's a lifetime fan of Doctor Who um, and has done amazing things in terms of working for Doctor Who magazine, uh, in terms of working for BBC Wales. He's written dozens of books uh, on Doctor Who and other topics as well. Um, but part of what we want to talk to them about today is, of course, his contribution to Big Finish. Because he, along with uh, Jason Haig Ellery, are really the creators of all that we get to enjoy today of more than 20 years of great stories. So, Gary, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you very much for asking me. I'm very flattered. Excellent. Do you want to start off by telling us how you're going at the moment? How's, how's London? How's, are you in London? I'm not in London. I'm in Cardiff. I, okay. I, when I, when I um, got the job at the BBC up here, I fell in love with Cardiff in about two minutes and moved, had a few houses up here, flats, apartments up here. And then one day when Julie Gardner was moving to America... She randomly said, do you want to rent my house rather than a series of apartments? And I went, oh, that would be fun. And it's a big house. So I was renting it and I moved finally all my belongings from London up to here and thought, well, this is good. And she said, you can have it for three years. We're going to be in America for three years. So I moved in here ostensibly for three years, moved all my stuff up. And then three months later, she said, oh, change of plan. We've decided to buy a house here in Los Angeles. We would need lots of money. So we're going to sell the place in Cardiff so you have to move out again and I went I'll tell you what uh, I will buy it from you which was the most insane random thing I've ever said to anyone in my life and I think my mouth was moving and my brain was going what 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 are you talking about how are you going to afford to buy that house but I did and and so I've been here ever since so yes I live in Julie Gardner's old house and, and it's been mine now for oh, 10 years no more than that now uh, 12 years I've lived here in this house. So yes, life in Cardiff is currently snowy and uh, I love it. I love this city with a passion. Um, 
if I could get a, if I could change my passport from English to Welsh, I'd do it in a heartbeat. Um, <laughs> very, 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 very in love with Wales. Very pro Welsh independence, and I think it's a brilliant, brilliant city and the best place in the world. Apart from Sydney, obviously, which I also love. <laughs> it's okay we're very multi uh, nation here we don't mind <laughs> now you're you're known fan wide um as years and years decades of being a strong doctor who fan I decades i like decades yes decades yes. Just how old are you gary russell oh well i've been in doctor who fan for decades apparently <laughs> thanks for that that's Although okay scarily you're right i have so how did you first get to love the show I think I, I fell in, I can't tell you when I fell in love with it per se. I know the first thing I ever saw was the 10th Planet Regeneration. I remember that vividly. I think it was one of those shows that I've got two older brothers and I think they probably on a Saturday afternoon tended to be put in charge of looking after their baby brother um, and they watched Doctor Who. So I think they just sat me down and watched it. And with me, it stayed with me. And then I sort of watched it fairly religiously from sort of season five onwards very random spots of memories from season five and then season six I remember quite clearly and then when Pertwee came along suddenly that was the point where I would say I call myself a fan where I just I, I was very unhappy if there was any ever a prospect of me missing an episode and also you know you're in the late 60s early 70s Doctor Who was was the cool show here. I think it lost that by the time you get to the, the end of the 70s. But that sort of late Troughton and all of Pertwee in the first couple of years of Tom, Doctor Who, to not like Doctor Who in the UK, you were the weird one that sat in the corner and didn't have any friends. And then that went sort of about face over the sort of the next four or five years. So that by the time you get to the end of Tom, if you like Doctor Who, you're the weird one sitting in the corner and, and, and you have no friends uh, because everybody's watching the A-Team or Buck Rogers or, you know, something else entirely. So, yeah, I grew up at a point where Doctor Who was, was the cool thing that everybody loved, a bit like it is today, which is rather nice. A lot of those um, early memories that you have, when you later came to watch videos when they were released and things of those early shows, because, I mean, out here in Australia, we just had constant Doctor Who playing every night, repeat over and over again. So we saw the shows, you know, over and over. You tended to have them shown once and you missed it, you were in trouble. Again. Never again. Yeah. So when you later got to watch back shows that you'd seen as a little kid, were the memories the same or had you imagined things differently? Well, it's interesting you say that. My biggest thing about my memories of Doctor Who is they're backwards. So I... I have very vivid memories let's let's say for instance the invasion if you had said to me what happens to packer at the end of the invasion i would have said a cyberman walks in from the right hand side of the screen and kills him and then i watched it when i got some weird australian video i'm sure back in the sort of early 80s and the cyberman comes in from the left and i'm like but my memory is the other way around and there are a lot of things like that I remember the the um the fist coming through the glass of the Primord in Invasion. The first time I saw Invasion again, I went, no, that's the wrong way around. The fist came in from the other direction. And I've talked to a few people about this, and this seems to be a fairly common thing with memory, um, not just obviously of, of the TV, but memory generally, is when you're a certain age and your brain's developing, you often flip images in your head and you will swear blind that, that you know, a car came from you towards you from left to right, but in fact it was right to left and things like that. And that's something that seems to happen with kids until your brain, you know, properly develops and you start your memory starts remembering things accurately. So yes, a lot of my Doctor Who memories are, are literally flipped; they're backwards. But seeing it all for the first time was a lot of punching the air moments for me, and just going, "My God, this is still as brilliant as I remember it." Doctor Who was just it was my life, you know, when I was sort of five, six, seven, eight, nine. It, it was, my life revolved around watching Doctor Who every Saturday and, and this weird anticipation between seasons of you know, Doctor Who suddenly ended and you were bereft for what seemed like in the next hundred years. And then, you know, nine months later, it would turn up again. We didn't have this constant 
like you had this constant, it was there all the time. And so the three weeks leading up to a new series of Doctor Who were the most exciting thing in the world ever, waiting for this show to come back. And then I just remember the point where it did come back and I watched it and just went, oh. And I can't explain the sheer weight of depression that hit my sort of what would I have been. I'm talking key to time season. I'm talking episode one of the Rybos operation. I'm watching that. And I think I'd been aware the previous couple of years had been a bit, uh, I'd loved everything up into the sun makers and then underworld happened. And I was like, Oh, this is like a different show. And Tom Baker was suddenly like, I think for him, it happens in the sun makers. You look at sort of horror of Fang rock and, and, and certainly, um, image of the Fendal and he's playing the same doctor he's played since robot and then there's a switch is flicked and then for the sun makers he's playing everything for laughs and silly expressions and things like that and for me I couldn't quite deal with that and I sort of suffered that through to the end of invasion time and then Reboss came along and I watched it and I thought oh no I've grown out of this show I stuck with it I never stopped watching it but I didn't get the pleasure out of it it became became almost a chore and by the time we got to season 17 and destiny of the daleks and and city of death which i still despise and then (laughs) creature from the pit i remember just creature from the pit was the first time i voluntarily missed an episode of doctor who episode three creature from the pit i think i was out with a mate and we were probably in london buying records or something as we did back then and I just, you know, he was saying, oh, God, you're going to miss Doctor Who. You're not going to get home in time for Doctor Who. And I was like, eh, I don't care. And I, you know, I then dipped in for the rest of that season. I, I remember enjoying bits of Nightmare of Eden, not enjoying Hordes of Nymon at all. And then Leisure Hive started nine months later and suddenly the world made sense again and Doctor Who was being taken seriously. So I think I'm one of those tedious people that likes my Doctor Who to be quite serious and quite po-faced and quite dull. (laughs) And then Davison came along and I was in love with the show all over again because he was, he was just brilliant. Next to Pertwee, Davison's always been my favourite doctor. I mean, it goes, it goes, it goes Pertwee, Davison, Tennant, and then a sort of general melee of lots of others. At the time when you were so obsessed with Doctor Who, were there other shows you were equally obsessed with that came in and out or was just the one show? No. No, I, I just Doctor Who. I mean, I avidly watched things like The Tomorrow People and Ace of Wands. And I remember watching Survivors, feeling very grown up watching that. And I liked all those shows and I wouldn't want to miss an episode of them. But Doctor Who was was the passion. Doctor Who was where I was sort of drawing very bad Daleks in books at school and, and, and writing Doctor Who stories for myself and my friends and things like that. There's a little group of about four of us. We used to sit and write Doctor Who books, like the target books for each other, but they were only about 10 pages long. We thought that was enough. And we'd, we'd, you know, get the pages and we'd staple them together and draw covers and we'd hand them over to each other. So, you know, Doctor Who was was the creative passion for me. I think that's the joy of Doctor Who. is It is a very inspirational show for creative people. I, I think, you know, I used to say Star Trek was a really good show for scientists and doctors and everyone would watch Star Trek and wanted to be a scientist or a doctor. And I think Doctor Who is a show that inspired and gen- well, probably now two generations of people who wanted to immediately go and work in television. I don't think there was any point that when you watched Doctor Who, no matter when it was on, that you didn't go, this is a TV show made fairly cheaply in a studio. But I think it inspired people to be writers and directors and artists and designers. And I think it's one of the few shows that really made people want to do stuff in that medium because they could see what potential there was in Doctor Who that, you know, costume dramas and soaps and everything, brilliant as they all are, it didn't inspire the imagination in sort of kids beginning to think what they wanted to do with their lives. And I think Doctor Who is is very responsible for that. And it's interesting if you talk to people who work in television today, my age and maybe 10 years younger, and they will almost all say that Doctor Who was a big reason why they got into television. It is, it's created generations. And now with the new series and everything, we, I think of it as the new series, it's what are we? We're the equivalent now of the key to time season, I think. Mm-hmm. So 15 years in. And that show has similarly, there's a lot of sort of 20 to 25 year olds working in TV at the moment doing their first jobs. And they've done it because they became fans of Doctor Who as well. It's a brilliant show for that. It's, it's just 
it inspires creativity in people. And that's the wonderful thing about fandom as well, is that, you know, it's a very creative fandom. We've got CGI on DVDs these days that changes the special effects. Back in the 80s when I was... Uh, I, I, I say Pertwee was my doctor, but uh, he was repeated in the 80s. So that's the doctor I saw mostly. So I wasn't contemporary of his, but he was my doctor. And it was the Target books that actually enhanced the TV shows. I remember swearing blind that Day of the Daleks had that scene at the end that was flipped over uh, from the from the beginning of that story. So I had all those enhancements in my mind. And it's interesting that you mentioned that about seeing things differently in your memory. So were you influenced by the Target books as well? Because that was something I did when I was younger, constantly borrowing the Target books from the library and reading them over and over. Did they go towards you uh, and your desire to become a writer? Yes, 100%. I was obsessed and still am obsessed with the entire Target range. To me, it's it's the next most important thing about Doctor Who other than the show itself. And there are times when it's more important than the show as well. Absolutely. The, growing up with the Target books, growing up with, with Cherry Sticks and particularly Malcolm Hulk, who I think is the greatest Doctor Who novelist of the lot. I mean, I was an avid reader from a very young age. I, I could read quite well by the time I was about three because... My mum's best friend was a, was an English teacher, so she used to come around and she taught me to read at a very early age. So I was reading a lot of books by the time I was sort of seven, eight, nine. And so when the targets were launched, I just grabbed them and, and, and swallowed them up. And Day of the Daleks and the Doomsday Weapon, which were the first two I bought, I must have read a hundred times sort of between then and when I was about 15. And so much, so so many words that I have learned in life all come from target books. And I used to sit there sometimes and I had a sort of kid's dictionary. And if I ever came across a word in a, in a Doctor Who novel, and usually it was once by Malcolm Hull or Barry Letts' Demons had quite a few words I didn't really know, grab the dictionary and look them up and find out what they meant. Um, great teaching devices, the target books, really good. So yeah, I'm obsessed with them to the extent that, you know, any books or magazines or articles about Target, I'm devouring them more than anything else. And I have a, a house um, here with with a staircase and two wall landings, no, landing walls, that's the way around, that are covered with the original paintings that I've got over the years at very expensive costs, because that's how obsessed I am with Target books is that I have a number of Chris Achilleases and, and Skeletors and I've got a Jeff Cummings and a Alistair and things like that all up my walls and lots of David McAllister ones as well. Yes, part of the uh, dangers of lockdown is that uh, I completed my entire Target Blue Spine collection to go with oh, all my original that's targets. expensive. Tell me about it. And Blue I'm just, Spines are expensive to wrap up, aren't they? And I've just started my hardback collection too, so... Good luck. <laughs> Good luck with that one. I, I'm not going to finish. I know I'm not going to finish that one. It's too expensive, but I'm having fun at the moment. Can I just say congratulations on your first Target book about to come out? Yeah, thank you. I, that's a lifelong ambition, I could tell you. So how does it, how does it feel knowing that you've, you've got your own Target about to come out? Oh, it's fantastic. It's brilliant. I mean, and I'm pleased as well that it's not just a straight reprint of the original. We were able to tweak a few things. So it does feel sort of special enough to justify it being a Target book now rather than just a, a BBC book. Yeah, I love it. And it's obviously got a better cover than the original. I mean, the original <laughs> was lovely, but it's a photograph of Paul. And, you know, it was the photograph that was everywhere at the time. And now I've got a nice Anthony Dry cover, uh, which he very kindly the other day sent me the original of because he draws them by hand and then scans them in to colour them. But I've got downstairs when COVID is over and my local framer is reopened, it will be framed and go on the wall. Uh, but yeah, he sent me the original black and white sketch, which is beautiful. When did you know that was going to happen? And what was the process in terms of preparing for us? They contacted me. Where are we now? We're March. So it must have been over a year ago because it was before COVID, long before COVID. I knew certainly knew then but it hadn't been announced so i must have known at the end of 2019 it must have been around october november 2019 that they got in touch with me and said look we're going to do another range of target books for summer 2020 and we'd like to do the tv movie and are you interested is, is there anything we know that you have said in the past that there was stuff cut out of it 
do you want to put that back in or do you want to treat this as a, as a straight reprint? They gave me that option. And I said, no, I want to have a little bit of a play. When the book first came out and the internet was relatively new, but I have saved, which I didn't realise I still had saved, and I'm quite pleased that I found them, a few quite negative reviews of the novelisation. And they were negative, not because... Not, not just because they thought it was crap, uh, but also they they were tended to be from Americans who were deeply offended at the fact that I, I called San Francisco Bay a river, which, you know, which is probably <laughs> fair enough. And I got a lot of the geography in San Francisco wrong. And of course, I was working from a script. I had no visual material at all to look at. The only thing I, while I was working on the novel, I saw one tiny clip, which was the moment where the master spits acid into Grace's face in the back of the ambulance. So I saw that. And I had requested, because I had no idea from the script, what the device that the master puts on the doctor's head at the very end to force his eyes open was. So they sent me the design sketch of that. And those are the only two visual references I had when I did the original novelization. So here we are 20 years and a bit later. And of course, now I know what it all looks like. So I was able to go through and, and either tweak or add or change for the better my original descriptions of what people and and sets look like because now I knew I knew what the TARDIS interior looked like in the original which I hadn't realized until I sat down to do this new version I've got the the two female doctors Wheeler and the other one whose name I can't remember I've got them the wrong way around in the novel completely so I've managed to put them the right way around now uh there's so little things like that and I just tweaked the beginning and made I think in the original, the Doctor gets a message from the Time Lords and says, go and pick up the Master's remains. And now I've made that quite clearly Romana, President Romana. And I've tweaked the ending very slightly because I never really understood. I, I understood completely all the stuff in the TARDIS. I actually never quite got my head around the final scene with Grace and the Doctor in, in the park at the end. The script wasn't really clear as to what was going on. Uh, so I was able to tart that up a bit. So it's, it's just tweaks and, and sort of mild improvements. It's, it's not even a new coat of paint. It's just, you know, a bit of a polish. A couple of episodes ago, we were talking about uh, an audio book of Doctor Who and the Cricket Men, which was read by Dan Starkey. I don't know if you've had a chance to hear that, but uh, I noticed that Dan Starkey's doing the audio book of, of your novel. How do you feel about Dan reading that one? Have you uh, got any thoughts on that? Well, I, I'm excited uh, because I think Dan's brilliant at doing audiobooks and Dan's been a friend of mine for quite a few years now. Uh, so I'm very pleased that it's it's somebody I know and adore is doing this. It's interesting because I think my first thought was, I wonder if they'll get Paul. And then I thought, no, they probably won't. And then I thought, well, who else are you going to get who's connected with the TV movie? And I thought, no, they'll have to go for a, a standard reader. So I assumed it probably would be. Either they would either go Peter Purvis or they'd go Dan Starkey and they went Dan Starkey. Um, so I was very pleased, very, very flattered that he's done it, which is brilliant. Are you hoping you might get an invite to write another Target novel of one of the other shows? That would be rather lovely. I've said to Russell a couple of times, if they ask you, cough, cough, put my name forward because, you know, you haven't got time to possibly do this. And then I've said the same to Chris Chibnall as well. I said, oi, oi, I, I want to <laughs> novelise all your stories for Target. And he's like, yeah, maybe I want to novelise them all. I think, oh, but Chris, you're too busy. Um, so, yeah, I'd love to do one. But no, I don't think they'll ever ask me. I think they've got their their little, um, their versions of Terrence Dix and Malcolm Hulk and everything that they go to time and time again. And and I'm not part of that, that little cadre anymore. So I can't imagine they would ever ask me. Are we expecting this will be an annual event? They'll just release five or six books every summer? I think if the song is there, they keep selling as long as they're successful. Yes, I think they've got a uh, a slight, I don't know whether it's a problem, from a marketing point of view, they've probably got a slight problem now in that the first wave they did were kind of, oh, look, new and exciting, we've reprinted these books. And then they started doing something like, look, now we've put the pirate, or we've put City of Death into a target book. Oh, that's good. Now we've put the Pirate Planet and Revelation and, and Resurrection into a target book. Oh, that's that completed. They haven't actually got anything else they can really do now from a marketing point of view, other than here are some more novelizations of the current series. They've got no classic books. I mean, I suppose they could do a, a target version of Sharda, 
But I think, you know, Gareth or someone would have to cut that down a bit. But I think that's probably about it. I, I did suggest to them, which got shot down in flames, which I was disappointed by, I suggested to them doing, I would happily do the uh, John Leakley and, um, oh, who's the other one? Oh my God, how embarrassing. The other TV movie script, novelised uh, film script, whose name I just cannot remember, which is really embarrassing now. But I've got, all the different versions of the, their various scripts. And I said, it might be quite fun to do these alternate first stories for the eighth doctor or just turn them into Joe Martin books or something like that would be quite fun. But no, that got shot down in flames. I said, damn, if my name was James Goss, you'd probably have done it. But you know, they didn't laugh at that joke either. <laughs> I went away with my tail between my legs. So yeah, that I would, I think those would be an interesting thing to do is to actually novelize the, the, the alternate, TV movie books because both those scripts are vastly different from each other and bear no resemblance at all to what actually got made. I think it would be quite fun to have those missing Paul McGann stories out there. Yeah, it would be. Now, how did you end up in uh, Doctor Who magazine world as editor for that? I'd written for the magazine, obviously. My, my first writing for the mag was 1983. Alan McKenzie wrote, I'd been editing Celestial Toy Room for the Doctor Appreciation Society, the newsletter. So I'd been in touch with Alan McKenzie every month. I'd ring him up and he was the editor and say, what's in the next Doctor Who magazine? I can put it in CT. And then he was looking for writers and he wrote to me out of the blue one day and said, look, you know, I've always enjoyed our conversations. Would you be interested in writing for Doctor Who magazine? And I was like, yeah. So that's, that started then. And so I went through a series of editors and none of them ever fired me, which was quite exciting considering I got some of them into trouble at various points, but I never got fired. And then one day I was, John Freeman and I were going to a convention together and he actually offered me my first comic strip and said, do you want to write a comic strip? And it would be a humorous one. And I said, yes, always wanted to write comic strips. So I wrote Party Animals, which John then completely rewrote. It was, ended up being sort of my storyline, but all the dialogue got rewritten. So I, this magazine, this, I think it was a one-parter and it came out as a game. Oh, well, that's very beautiful artwork by Mike Collins. I don't recognise a single one of the words in it. But, you know, he and I got on quite well doing that. And obviously I've been working for him for a couple of years anyway, doing book reviews and things. And out of the blue, he just suddenly said one day, I need an assistant. Would you be interested in a full-time job at Marvel? Which I think I literally swallowed some air before saying yes. And then that came to pass. And I always remember, my, for some bizarre reason, I started on a Thursday at Marvel UK. And I walked through the door and John greeted me and took me up to the office that he was working and shared with a few other people. And I sat there going, wow, this is Marvel UK. This is very exciting. And he was showing me, you know, when we do Doctor Who magazine, we do this and we do this and we get this from here. And he was showing me where everything was. And I thought, well, this is quite good. You know, you're, you're telling me everything I need to know. At which point he then said the next day, which was a Friday, right, I'm off to America for two weeks. So uh, can you finish off? issue 183 of Doctor Who magazine and, and, you know, just get it to the printers and I'll see you in two weeks. And I was like, what? I've been here for 48 hours. So yeah, issue 183 of Doctor Who magazine with the, the giant robot video cover it was a bit of a baptism of fire. John was in, in Chicago. This would have been November 1981, that 1991, sorry. And then he came back from Chicago and we did one more issue and he said, right, um, I'm moving up in the company. You're now the editor of Doctor Who magazine. And I'd been in there for, what, three weeks at that point when he gave me that bit of information. And I realised that really, actually, he'd employed me right from, the, from day one as a potential replacement for him, but hadn't told me. So I was a bit freaked out about that. But yeah, so, so Doctor Who with, with Pete Warbank's Enlightenment cover is my first proper, entirely me edited issue of Doctor Who magazine. And then I stayed there for the next three and a half years I think saw through the 30th anniversary which was enormous fun to be around and then when did I leave 1985 95 Gary get your dates right 1995 by which time I'd employed Gary Gillett to take over from me as the editor and I was running the sort of whole magazines department we had three or four magazines going and then one day Panini walked through the front door and said we're in charge now and lots of people were asked to leave the building and I was one of them. And that was the end of my Doctor Who magazine career. Boom, just like that. One day I was there as a group editor. The next day I was sitting at home going, oh, this is what it's like to be unemployed 
involuntarily. Okay. But Doctor Who magazine, of everything I've ever done, I think Doctor Who magazine was probably my favourite job. Very rarely had a, a dull moment. It got a bit eh, towards the end. And certainly when we knew Panini were coming along, it was like, oh, I think the people running Panini now are lovely. But the first wave of people that came to run Panini were not lovely people at all. They didn't last long either, which was good. But generally, I loved Doctor Who magazine. It was just an enormous fun thing to do. And it had a certain amount of respect. I wasn't, I only had to fill 44 pages, I think, a month. So believe me, that, that back there was, was every four weeks. Back then, that seemed a mammoth task. And looking at, at what Marcus has to try and fill now with his perfect bound, getting on for 100 pages every four weeks, oh, I wouldn't have wanted to do that. I always said when I was editor that the one glorious thing I had was no show on air. I was the first Doctor Who magazine editor never to have a TV show going on. And I always said I wouldn't want to run Doctor Who magazine when it was in production because that fight for information and that fight for knowledge and that fight to be the first of the official magazine, blah, 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 to get these pictures didn't interest me. I liked Doctor Who magazine because I was able to turn it into a sort of a, a reference work, a part work almost. So that really pleased me. So when I left and then, you know, two minutes after I'd gone out the door, poor old Gary Gillett got lumbered with, oh, look, there's going to be a TV movie with Paul McGann made in Canada. And he had to schlep over to Canada and fight, really, to, to get access and all this sort of stuff. That wasn't for me. And I think he did that magnificently. I couldn't have done that. I would have sent someone else because I would have just gone, no, not interested in that kind of battle. And then, you know, I think Gary turned the magazine around and, and just improved it in leaps and bounds. I think he's probably the, the best DWM editor there ever was. So during that period, you started writing your first professional novels. Is that right? I did. With I Doctor did Legacy, Legacy? in 1994. Well, I did Legacy in 93, but it came out in 94, yeah. Was it hard to balance writing and the jobs? No, I, I had a, a very... Um, <laughs> I had a, a very forgiving boyfriend who I would come home from work and having done a day at Marvel and say, right, I'm going to the bedroom now and I've got to write a book. And he'd sit there and make dinner and... Uh, we watched Coronation Street. I'm going, all right, going back to write a book now. And Legacy took quite a long time to do, actually, I think. Written on an old Amstrad with Loco script. God, I wish I still had those discs. That would be quite interesting to find out what nonsense is on there. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was great. It was it was an unexpected pleasure. I'd interviewed Peter Darvel Evans when he first started up The New Adventures before any of them were ever published. And we talked about it. And he said his plan was to send out this thing to people. He wanted to bring in new authors and give everyone a chance to write Doctor Who books, which I think actually with hindsight is uh, we can't afford to pay professional writers to write these books. So let's get a fleece a load of Doctor Who fans and get them to work for cheap money. And we'll have a range of Doctor Who books. It actually works quite well for him. So we talked about that at the time. And then I became the editor of Doctor Who magazine. And I did another interview with him because at that point, I think the first four had been out and we talked about him commissioning Paul and he was just doing, I think he just commissioned Nightshade at the next time I interviewed him. And I was here to Dr. Who magazine by that point, but only by a few weeks. And I honestly can't remember. I think it was my idea. I just decided, having listened to him twice then, that I would just send him an idea. I had no real plans to be a novelist in any way shape or form but I wanted to write a story about Peladon and Ice Warriors because that story had been in my head since I was 12 years old and so I sent it to him and I never heard a thing never heard a word and then in the September I think of 93 so yes it was all around the time of, no it'd be earlier it'd be in April 93 because it was before the big 93 convention but it was at a small convention down in, in Bournemouth or Southampton. And Peter was a guest and I was doing interviewing on stage with people. And we were in the green room and he was doing an interview with a fanzine, some with a little tape recorder. And I was in that room, as was Gareth Roberts, I think. And he was talking to this guy, just listening in on the corner here. And he was talking to this guy and said, oh, and Gareth here, you know, he's doing his second book. And Justin Richards is going to do a book called Theatre of War. And then he just leaned over and he said, and Gary's writing uh, Legacy. And I was like a rabbit caught in headlights thinking, well, what? And he finishes the interview. And I'm sitting there thinking, I went over to him and said, Peter, could you just repeat what you just said? He said, we haven't heard back from you. 
And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, we, we sent you a letter confirming we were commissioning this book, but we haven't heard back from you for the last six weeks or so. I wasn't sure if you were still interested. And I was like, I have no letter. Um, and that's how I found out I'd been commissioned to write Legacy. Um, and then it was a lot of hard work, believe me, because I did, I mean, the published one isn't, you know, free of this by any means, but oh my God, my various versions of that book were every bit of bad fan writing you could possibly imagine as you threw in every continuity reference you possibly could because she thought this is going to be my only chance ever writing a book. So it's going to be every book I've ever wanted to write in one book. And Peter was incredibly patient with me, an incredibly good teacher. And we stripped it down and he let me get away with a lot that I wouldn't let someone get away with, frankly, now. But he let me get away with a lot then to get that out of my system. And Legacy is, you know, the ultimate version of Fan Wank, really. But my God, I enjoyed it. And, and it was quite successful at the time. And then they commissioned me for another one very, very quickly. I said I didn't want to do any more new adventures. So the moment the missing adventures were announced, I was sort of on the phone going, right, what can I do? I want to do with Patrick Troughton. And boom, that really, I think, Invasion of the Cat People is more yeah. the start of my writing career, if you want, than it, the legacy was, because legacy, I just assumed, was going to be a one-off from my point of view. And the fact they asked me for another one just suddenly went, oh, that's the confidence boost. And so, boom, suddenly I was doing, you know, I'd finish a book and very soon after one, that another one would come along. And I had a very lucky run for a few years of, of sort of when they went to BBC Books as well, just... Always, I seem to have a Doctor Who book on the go, one a year or one every 18 months or something like that. And again, with the, the BBC books, I did one Paul McGann book and I didn't really enjoy being part of that ongoing thing. I said, no, I'm much happier if I'm writing a standalone classic Doctor and, you know, I would rather write Pertwee or preferably Colin Baker and Bonnie Langford. They're my, my big things. So that's what I did. And then I never got to write a Christopher Eccleston book, but by the time I was at the BBC, I was able to do a David Tennant, which I absolutely loved. And then I did a Matt Smith, and then I did a Peter Crowley. But I've never done a, a Jodie. I'd like to do a Jodie. I love Jodie's Doctor. I love the current Doctor Who. I think it's fabulous. I mean, you, you had this huge book writing career, which you know, anyone would love to have. Career is putting it nicely, because career suggests that A, you make money out of it, and, and B, it's what you do for a job. And, and Unfortunately for me, it was always really a sideline. There was very few periods where I would actually say, I am writing for a living because I certainly never was. Okay. So in terms of your writing before professionally, had you been doing much fan writing for fan magazines? Is that how you ID started? When, when did the audio visu audiovisuals fit in here too? Well, I, I'd been doing my own fan. I said, just started my own fanzine in 1980 called Sharda, and occasionally I wrote a bit of fiction. And fiction was never something I imagined I would do, but I always wrote articles, and I wrote articles for other magazines, other fanzines. That sort of early 80s, incredibly creative period for British fanzines. And most of the people who were, were doing those fanzines went on to have quite an interesting career like me in writing books. So that was nice as well. You know, your Justin Richards and your Peter Angelides and Paul Cornell and all of these people all came from that early 80s fanzine sort of collective Audio visuals came about end of 84. I've always loved audio, always have done. And uh, I was friends with Bill Baggs and we were walking along a beach one day, Easter, 1984. And for some reason, we just said, you know, instead of doing fanzines, why don't we do Doctor Who audio plays and get someone in to play the Doctor and we'll write these audio plays. And just out of nowhere, this, this sort of thing triggered something in us. And we did it and we made it happen. And then a friend of Bill's, who's also called Nick, introduced us to Nick Briggs and he became our, our doctor from the second one onwards. And boom, off audio visuals went and Bill did it for the first three years. And I did it for the, I say the last year, I'd say Bill did it for the first three years. And I did one season in about 850 years at the end. It seemed to take forever. But that gave us, particularly myself and Briggsy, that gave us the grounding and the experience and the awareness of learning what you could and couldn't do with audio that became invaluable really for Big Finish, you know, what, 10 years later, or five years later, I suppose, by the time we finished. We learned so much. Nick and I both had an absolute passion for audio as a medium. Nick could do the one thing I couldn't do, uh, which was the technical side of it. You know, Nick could edit and post-produce and do music and all of these things. I could only write and direct. 
and Nick could also write and direct. So really, Nick didn't need anyone else. You know, Nick Nick was the ultimate one man band, really. Um, and I think there were times probably when we were doing audio visuals that Nick firmly believed that he didn't need anyone else as well. And, and the rest of us were all a bit of a hindrance and getting in his way. But it was good fun doing audio visuals. It really was. And I wouldn't wouldn't change any of it for a moment. It was just superb. We stopped in 91, I think, early 91. And then the TV movie happened. And I remember thinking it would be quite nice to do it again, but maybe do it properly. And I made some contacts at BBC Worldwide through both Doctor Who magazine and doing the TV movie novelization. So I went to this, this trio of ladies uh, who ran the audio department of BBC Worldwide. And I had a little brief meeting with them and said, look, what if you allowed people to do Doctor Who on audio, do, do dramas? You've done these readings, you've done your short trips and things like that, readings, and you, Paul McGann read an edited down version of the TV movie novelization. So, original drama done like radio four you know but but really good audio drama and they said no if, if anything like that was ever going to happen they would do it in-house you know and they were sort of looking at slip back and they were looking at the blake seven plays and paradise of death and things like that saying no no we would do it in-house i was like all right and so we went off jason and i and we did the bernie summerfield stuff instead because i was determined we were going to do something i was just bored and just needed to do audio again can I just ask, how do you know Jason? How did, how did Jason... Oh, my God. So Jason, I have known since he was 15 or 16, I think. I was not. I was living in London by then when I went home one weekend to my mum's and she said, oh, this strange boy knocked on the door during the week asking about you. And I said, really? She said, yeah, he, he, does, a, he does a fanzine like you used to and he realised that you lived around the corner so he came and knocked on the door and I said oh and she said but I told him you didn't live here anymore but next time you were home you, you'd go around and see him and I thought oh thanks that's that's what I really needed is to go and knock on some random stranger's door and say my mum told me to come and knock on your door but that's actually exactly what I did because he did quite literally live two roads away from me in this 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 house I used to go past every day I walked to school back in the old days and look up at this big house and think, I wonder who lives there? Because it was like a mansion in the middle of, of lots of houses that weren't mansions. And oh, look, Jason Hay Gallery lives there. And we just, we his fanzine that he was doing wasn't the Doctor Who fanzine. He was doing a fanzine based around uh, a Radio 4 show called Earth Search. He was obsessed with Earth Search. So immediately on top of the fact that we were both sort of vaguely sci-fi fans, I realised he was passionately interested in audio. So I got him in to play an alien in one of the audio visuals, which I think Jason would admit probably wasn't the greatest move and, and the greatest performance in the history of audio visuals. But yeah, I'd known Jason for about, when did we do Maynard? So Maynard would have been 86, 87, something like that. And so I'd known Jason for about two years at that point, I think. I think I met Jason in 85, I think. And so, yeah, we just were just friends. We just became friends and we were always friends. And also, you know, I thought in a naive kind of way, I thought, oh, he's bloody loaded, he is. So when I wanted to do these, originally the, the idea of doing Doctor Who audios with the BBC, I went to Jason and said, how about this as an idea? Will you fund it, please? Give me all your money that I can go and spend and I'll run Doctor Who for you. And, and you'll just make lots and lots and lots and lots of money. And Jason sort of said things like, I don't know why you think I've got lots of money and why you think I'd give you all my money and risk it. But I do have a company set up that is doing nothing, which keeps upsetting the tax man, called Big Finish. So we could, whatever we do, we could do through that. I said, great, great, great. So I said, I've got this meeting with the BBC. I'll let you know how it goes. And I went back and said, oh, they, they didn't like it. But that's when I suggested, why don't we do Bernie Summerfield? So we did. Dear Diary, it's me again, Benny. Have you missed me? I've been so busy recently. You know, saving the world a few times, that sort of thing. But now the world is safe again. Oh, yes, it is, Woolsey. Now, ah, that takes me back. The Princess Bernice and Woolsey the Cat. Oh, walk slower, Walls. If I put my feet down too hard, these glass slippers will create a horrible ankle hemorrhaging situation. The King's balls get bigger every year. But it wasn't just one big party, was it? Now, look at the floor. It's a complicated pattern. But what it almost certainly comes down to is... Don't step on the white tiles. Huh, these puzzles are often deceptively simple. You see, you're getting an archaeology field trip after all. 
Watch the expert. As I said, it all comes down to don't step on the black tiles. You think that would have put me off field trips with my students for a while, wouldn't you? Not me. Always a glutton for punishment, I am. Although, remind me not to say that when Jason's around. He gets excited when I say the word punishment. Oh, the ships are sitting duck. Can't you take evasive action? Evasive what? What do you think this is, a battleship? It takes 15 minutes to make a 45 degree turn. Oh my god, the screen's full of them. Do we have weapons? No. Force field, shields, anything defensive? No. Nope. What about ordinary equipment we can use as a weapon or a disguise or something? Oh, you mean like confusing their targeting systems by ejecting the cargo? Fill the space between us with millions of tons of rice grapes, that sort of thing. Oh my god, Benny, yes, exactly that. Can you do it? No. Nope. My life is just one close shave. We have to go back. Don't be stupid, Bernice. We've got what we came for. We have to get this away from the sunless permanently. Bernice? Dr. Kitzinger? I know you can hear me. Bring me the visionary. Or Jason die. Oh, Jason. After all that, I really didn't think I'd see my darling ex-husband again. Shows how wrong a girl can be. <sighs> what sort of person calls on a girl before 3pm at a weekend, eh, Wolsey? Well, it's not fair. All right! Oh, goddess. Uh, hello, Benny. Um, don't I even get a hug? No, you bloody don't. What exactly are you doing here, Jason Kane? I can tell you're pleased to see me. Your nose always crinkles up. Actually, I was wondering if Wolsey had thrown up something. Oh no, it's your aftershave. Sorry. And despite that, I followed him all the way back to Babylon, where I met some very special people. Who are the pair of you? Uh, we're travellers. You have come from some country beyond the ones I know. One of the cold lands. Beyond the sea. Even further than that. I... I... Calm down. Look, please will you come with me? Because let me tell you, I'm puffed from chasing you around this damn city. If you'd rather take your chances, I'll leave you to it. I'll... I'll come with you. You see, he just needs to sleep it off. I want to talk to you, young lady. Return here tomorrow. Oh, sure. Um, in the morning. Considering the way my party is going. <laughs> Make that late in the morning. And that was the first time I saved the Earth. But it certainly wasn't the last time. You know, most archaeologists would love the chance to go back to the past, really see how things were. But I bet none of them would believe just how smelly history can be. Or how dangerous. Hey. Benny? What's that smell? I can't smell anything. Like ammonia. Come on, down here. Oh, Benny, really? This Shh. is not... I think something's going to happen. No, this is real. Just keep quiet. It, it will kill us. No, it, it hasn't even seen us. Keep absolutely still. No! Oh, keep away! Come on, Benny! No, we should come back! Oh, oh, poor Benny! Oh, no! 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 A world full of insects. Bring a chair in and tie her to it. Yes, Mr. Khan. Oh, don't go to any trouble on my account. It is no trouble, I assure you. No! Oh, my get off! <sighs> Thank you. You may leave us now. But, Mr. Khan... Leave us. Yes, Mr. Khan. OK, Khan. What's this all about? Insects, Professor Summerfield. So, I saved the world again. Got shot at, jumped on, tied up. <laughs> uh, another thing not to mention to Jason. And just when I thought things couldn't possibly get any worse, I found myself in the middle of the Second World War. Stay where you are. I'm armed. Oh, goddess. Who are you? Oh, hey. Your face looks familiar. No, I, I've just arrived on the island. My name is Bernie Summerfield. I am an agent of a hostile power. I am unarmed. I surrender. One of the most traumatic times of my life. Of both our lives. Not yet. You don't know Benny. She always saves the day. Oh, give me something to live up to, why don't you? Live up to? I'm sorry, Miss Summerfield, but that is irrelevant. 
You see, you are both dead. There were a few times when I thought I'd never get home again. But here I am, back in the 26th century at last. Back to a steady, uneventful life. Hmm. You know, now I come to think of it, I had some fun, didn't I? I wonder how long this peaceful bit is going to last. Oh, I could do with a bit of excitement again. Benny! Come back to bed. <laughs> excitement beckons. Oh, extract ends. I went to Virgin and said, we'd like the rights to do Bernie Summerfield. They said they would sort it all out. They would talk to Paul. They would talk to the various writers. We could adapt the books. At that point, that's what I wanted to do was adaptations. Little did I realise that the Virgin's idea of sorting things out was to sit back and go, yeah, we'll just take any flack that comes up if it does. So they gave us his licence that they probably really shouldn't have done. We talked to Paul. I mean, Paul was aware of it and up for it right from day one because, of course, he created Bernice. I would say less so that that was true of the authors whose books we were adapting, who we assumed version had taken care of and then discovered much to our chagrin that that wasn't the case at all. Um, and, and Kate Orman in particular was very, very angry and I think justifiably so. Um, she had no idea we were doing Walking to Babylon until almost it came out. But that was another valuable lesson I learned about don't trust other people who say they're going to do things. Do it yourself. It's much easier to be a control freak and get it right, or at least not necessarily get it right, but be a control freak so that when, when it all goes hideously wrong, you can at least turn around and say, well, look, this is what I did, rather than, well, they told me they were going to do that, which is what we did with the Virgin Sun. So we did these. We did the first Bennies. We did Oh No, It Isn't and Beyond the Sun. And I think we'd recorded Walking to Babylon. I don't think we'd done Birthright at that point. And then out of the blue, I got an email from one of the ladies I'd seen at the BBC that previous year saying, we want to talk to you about your Bernie Summerfield audios. And I immediately went into full panic mode and thought, oh, my God, if we used a BBC sound effect or something like that, we're going to get sued. Oh, my God. And I remember talking to Steve Cole, who was in charge of everything Doctor Who related at BBC Books and indeed was basically in charge of all things Doctor Who at BBC Worldwide at that point. He said, oh, my God, what have I done? What have I done? What have I done? And he said, oh, don't worry about it. Just, you know, go and have that meeting. So Jason and I both went to this meeting expecting that we were going to get told off. And we went in. And it was the same three ladies I had seen 12 months previously who had turned us down. And they sat there and said, oh, Steve Cole has shown us these two Benny, Benny Summerfield audios. And they had them cassettes in their hands. And they said, we've had a really good idea. We think it would be a really good idea to do things like this for Doctor Who. And I sat there thinking, <laughs> I, I think you three last year, me. but I, And Jason sort of holding my arm and squeezing it and saying, shut up, shut up, shut up. And they said, and, and we've listened to these and Steve thinks that, you know, you're pretty brilliant at what you know what you're doing. So would you like a license to do official Doctor Who audio dramas? Again, it was one of those things that the breath didn't leave my mouth. Where I went, yes. And I started to go, but you did last year. And Jason was like, shut up. I want to tell them that they're wrong. We could have done this a year ago. And Jason went, no, learn when to shut up. And when just to go, yes, that's a great idea. You've had BBC. And so that was, that really was it. It was down to Steve Cole. We didn't know that at the time. We realised when we went out afterwards and Steve was waiting for us in the canteen with a big grin on his face going, so did that go well? And I went, you set this up. You didn't tell me. But yeah, he'd set it up so that we would go in there and we would get the licence to do Doctor Who audios. And we did. And, and to be honest with you, it was very easy to do. I remember saying, you know, what we have to do? How do we get approvals? Oh, it all goes through Steve Cole. I thought, oh, that's going to be a lot easier then. I was imagining, you know, these three ladies and about 650 other people at BBC Worldwide would have to sign off on every dotted I and cross T. But no, it all went through Steve Cole. I do remember Jason, because he's very sensible, unlike me, saying we're not starting till we've got a signed contract. You know, we don't do anything without a signed contract because if we invest all this money and we set this up and we start doing stuff and then the BBC went, I <laughs> should know what we've changed our minds. We could be in deep trouble. And I said, yeah, that's very sensible, Jason. 
And frankly, after about eight months of not having a contract, I was going, we are going to have to make this without this contract. Oh, says Jason, we have to have the contract. And Steve Cole kept saying, just just go ahead and do it. They're not going to change their mind. Believe me, it's all up above. But it's just the BBC. They just take forever to do contracts. And we actually didn't have the contract signed until we did Phantasmagoria. We, we, had the, we, we, knew, we knew it was coming. We'd had a couple of drafts, but we didn't have an actual signed contract in our hands until we were recording Phantasmagoria. So Science of Time was done without an official contract, although we'd done, as a couple of drafts by that point. But really, you know, I would have to say the, the, the unsung hero always of, of Big Finish is Steve Cole, because he was the one that took those things to those three ladies, very wise ladies, and said, you know, you want to talk to these people and let them do talk to you on audio because they will do it very well <laughs> it's a good thing you didn't get us straight away or we wouldn't have benny well this is probably true and, and i actually don't think we'd have been very good we learned a lot you know i say nick and i'd learned a lot through audio visuals but that was nothing compared to what we learned from doing those bennies because for the bennies other than oh no it isn't but from beyond the sun onwards we were actually using a proper professional recording studio with proper mics and blah, 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 and the whole setup and everything. And that taught us even more than we'd known at audiovisuals, which very frequently some were done in, in soundproofed areas that may have been called studios, but we didn't use the actual equipment. We were still just using basic microphones attached to Nick's old 8-track. So this was the first time we were actually in a proper professional studio environment with all the bells and whistles that go with that. So, yeah, the, the Benny stuff was, was the most important learning curve for all of us, just to hone it. And, you know, Nick was there from the beginning as well, but he wasn't there. He wasn't part of the sort of, if you like, the creative side of deciding what Doctor Who was going to do and the commission scripts. That was solely me. I used to say, you know, my job is to sit in a room and spend Jason's money and make Doctor Who. And then I would talk to Nick and I would talk to occasionally Jason and Steve Cole an awful lot and Jack Rayner and people like that. And we bat around ideas and things. But the bottom line is it was, it, those early days were a one man band, which was, which was me supported by everyone else. But the buck stopped with me on everything. And that's where we'll leave our discussion with Gary Russell for the time being. Make sure you subscribe to the Sirens of Audio to be sure to find out when parts two and three of this fantastic in-depth interview with Gary Russell drop. Just as a recommendation for this episode, I'd like to just promote something that I've recently done for one of Mark Cockrum's podcasts, Nerdology. A little while back, I was privileged to be able to have a chat with one of my childhood heroes, because I was a teenager when the show was on, uh, Jim Baker, who played Henry in the Tripods in the early 1980s for the BBC TV series. And... It has dropped recently on the Nerdology feed, so check that out. Um, I would love to recommend that to you. Um, he gives some great insights uh, about the show, um, and this is a must-listen for any fans of the Tripods. So I was very proud of that one, and thanks to Mark Cockrum for allowing me to do that for his Nerdology feed. And as usual, uh, be sure to subscribe to the Sirens of Audio on Uh, your favourite podcasting app, whether it be Apple Podcasts, you can rate and review us there. Please do. You can also subscribe to us on YouTube, where most of our episodes are now dropping as well in one form or another. If you want to contact us, you can do that via email, sirensofaudio at gmail.com. Be sure to check our website at sirensofaudio.com. Our Twitter handle is at audiosirens, and you can search for us on Facebook and join our group. And until we meet again, where you know exactly where, and you know exactly when, I've just told you how to do it. Keep listening to lots of lovely audio drama, because audio drama... RAW!